Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Laura Gassner Oting, uh, and her new book, Wonder Hell, uh, is actually available as from today. An amazing conversation from an amazing person, very inspiring, going to learn a lot about yourself, and you're going to hear stories and maybe the moral of the stories that you can apply uh, to yourself. So enjoy the conversation with Laura. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. And today, I can't believe I can talk to her. She is an amazing person, entrepreneur, executive coach, writer. She's appearing on TV. She's been working, helping people in politics, in executive search. She's an entrepreneur. I mean, I think that there's about at least two people like you. There should be twins that we don't know about. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Laura Gassner Otting. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, I'm so thrilled to be here with you, Eric. I've been looking forward to this conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you. It's, I didn't know where to start because you are have such a rich life, so diverse. And, uh, you know, people always think it's uh, another overnight success that took 10 years in the making. So um, first thing first, what is your journey? Well, my journey is definitely more than 10 years to become an overnight success. But I will say my journey is, it's, it's sort of this long journey of accidental successes. I could probably write a story in reverse where it sounds like everything I did was strategic and thoughtful and intentional, but that would be nonsense. And I think it would do a disservice to people who are further behind me on the path to pretend like. I know what I'm doing because when I was looking at people further ahead of me on the path, it was like, they seem like such adults. They seem so put together. How do I do that? Right. How do I be them? Yeah. And when I was working in the White House, when I was 23 years old, I remember seeing people who had, you know, spouses and kids and cars and washer dryers. And I was like, they know what they're doing. They've got it all figured out. And then 10 years later, when I happened to see some of them at an event, I was like, how did you know what you were doing? I'm 32, 33 right now, and I don't know what I'm doing. And they were like, we were making it up as we went along. So I think that I could tell you that everything I did was purposeful. But the truth is, all I did, my journey is one of doing interesting things with interesting people and interesting opportunities arose. I was in law school. I realized I didn't want to be there. I dropped out. I joined a presidential campaign of this unknown Southern governor who was talking about this, this idea of community service. He said, there's nothing that's wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. And I was like, yes, that makes sense. And I still believe that to this day. And he offered a policy solution of service, community service in exchange for college tuition. And I was like, yes, that needs to happen. I dropped out and I joined the campaign and he ended up in the White House and I ended up in the White House and I helped build AmeriCorps, which was incredible. More than you know, a million and a half young people have served in it changing themselves while they're changing their community. Fantastic. About four years into it, I was like, I want to get back on my campaign trail. And my then boss, my mentor, who ran the 92 campaign said, well, you're kind of too old to get back on a campaign bus and sleep in high school gymnasiums and eat wow. cold pizza. Because, you know, 25 is like 107 in campaign years, right? But he said, but you're also too young to be the domestic policy advisor. So go talk to my friend, Arnie Miller. He runs the biggest search firm in the country that does specifically nonprofit executive search. He'll find you a job in a nonprofit, and then you'll hide out there for four years, and you'll come back and do something big on the Gore campaign. And I said, great. And five minutes into talking to Arnie, I was like, you know, your office is in Boston, and the guy I'm dating right now, who I think is Mr. Wright, P.S., we're celebrating 25 years of marriage later this month, he's wow. about to move to Boston. I should come work for you. And he goes, you should come work for me. And I'm like, great, I'll take the job. What exactly do you do? And that's how I became a headhunter. Five years into working for him, learning from the best and the brightest about how to do this work at the top, 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 top level, I realized that there was a better way, a way that had more profit for us, less cost for our clients, more authenticity, more integrity. And it just felt better all around. And I marched into his office and I was like, there's a better way. And he looked me in the eye and he goes, there's the door. And he ah. said, we love you. You're great. You could stay, please stay. But if you stay, you have to do things our way. And in that moment, I realized that I wasn't part of the solution for my clients, which meant that I was only in one place, which is that I was part of the problem for my clients. And so I left and I started my own firm and I grew that to 30 staff. We did hundreds of searches every year across the globe. And then after 15 years, I sold it to the women who helped me build it. 
which brings me to where I am today. About a month after selling it, I was like, who am I? When I'm no longer LGO, CEO. And I was the the chair of an art auction that uh, helps a local organization that does AIDS, uh, Action AIDS Research Services. And I remember saying, I don't want to get on stage. I don't want to speak. Speaking is terrifying. So my friend, Janet Wu, who was the uh, a local newscaster, says, well, I'm going to do the auction for you. She gets up on stage and she's like, before we get started, I want to thank my dear friend, Laura Gassner Otting, who dedicates her life to philanthropy. And in that moment, I was wearing this fancy gown and these fancy jewels that were lended to us by the you know sponsors of this event. And I looked at myself and I looked at my husband and I was like, oh my God, she just lady who lunched me. I'm a lady who lunches. And there's nothing wrong with dedicating your life to philanthropy, but it was only one part of my story. So I went home that night and because I'm super clever, I bought lauragassneraudding.com and I started blogging about stuff. And about a week later, the executive producer of TEDx Cambridge called me up and said, I read one of your posts. And I love it. And it would make a great talk. Would you come do a TEDx for us? Wow. And I said, no freaking way. Uh-huh. It's terrifying. I don't want to speak on stage. No, thank you. And I hang up the phone and my kids who were like 10 and 12 at the time, look at me and they're like, hey, mom, don't you always tell us we got to do things that scare us? And don't you always tell us that life starts on the other side of the fear? And don't you always tell us it doesn't challenge you? It doesn't change you. So well, what gives mom? So six weeks later, I'm on the stage and I give that talk. And that talk got some attention, which then got me offers to speak places for money. And after 20 years of being in consulting and deliverables, I was like, wait a minute, tell me more about this job. This is fascinating. And then as I started uh, realizing that people who were getting paid what I considered real money had books, I was like, I better get me one of them. So I wrote Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life based on 20 years of executive search and what I realized actually causes success and happiness. Mm-hmm. And that brings me to where I am today. Now, you know, I'm I'm five years into the speaking business. I'm about to launch my second book. I'm on the road everywhere doing media, doing speaking. And it is, by my count now, a fourth career that I never expected to have. That's wonderful. And, and we're going to talk about... Uh your last book, Wonder Hell, because uh, we're recording this, uh, but it's going to be broadcast on the 4th of April, which is today. Launch day. Listening. The book is uh, available. Um, but we're going to get to that in a minute. I just want to reflect on what you just said. Um, and, and the word that comes to me is serendipity. When, when you were talking about your career, and it's easy afterwards to try to pretend that there was a, a strategy uh, that that's ring the bell with me. Uh, my first job, I, I found it uh, after studying business uh, with, when I met a guy at a barbecue. Uh-huh. And then uh, the second one was uh, when I met people in ski holidays. So totally. Um, and I wanted to ask you, when do you know and how do you know that you need to end what you're doing right now? And move on to something else. Uh, is there? Is it the guts? Is it the reflection? Is it conversation with your husband? By the way, you're going 25. I just celebrate 23. So you have a Love little uh, advance on us. Yes, <laughs> as well. But how long were you together before you got married? Uh, after three months, I proposed. Oh wow! I said we were only together two years, and I thought you were going to tell me five years, and we were you were actually ahead of me. But see, when you know, you know, and that's your gut. So um, Wonder Hell is divided into uh, three sections, and it's sort of organized around this idea of an amusement park. You know, we think success is going to be fun, and then we get there and we're like, why isn't this more fun? Like, why is it actually getting harder? And just like an amusement park, you're like, I thought this was going to be fun. And then it's like three o'clock in the afternoon, and you're a little sunburned, and the corn dog in your stomach is kind of like wanting to make a break for the exit as you're in the line for the roller coaster. And you're like, what do I do now? Do I go to the bathroom? Do I wait in line? thought this was supposed to be fun. So it's organized into three sections. And those sections are Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City. And then in each one of those, there are five rides that mimic the emotions that we have as we go through this experience of the journey of realizing that every time we figure something out and we're successful, there are doors that open and there are doors that we didn't even know were available to us. And so what do we want to do with them? So there are a couple of rides I want to talk about that talk about the gut. The first one Uh, is really figuring out who you are, like figuring out who you are and what you're capable of. And there's this moment where you, where you do that and you just get so much doubt that comes your way because you're just not really sure. Like you were successful in one area, but you weren't necessarily, you haven't necessarily done something in the other. And so 
that's mm. the trapeze that I talk about when you when you're riding on the trapeze and you think there's going to be a net down there and you're used to having a net forever. So you know if you fail, everything's going to be fine, but suddenly you want to try something new and it's really scary. So how do we do that? We have to say that everything that got me to this thing today got me to this thing today. It mm. may not be the thing that's going to get me to the, you know, through the next thing, right. but at least it got me to this place where I have a foundation on which I can grow and I can build. And we can use certain tools like positive self-talk, right? Like your, your inner voice has seen a lot of stuff. So when your inner voice is screaming, it's time to move, it's time to change. Maybe you can do this. You should try. You should listen to it because that inner voice is collecting tons and tons of data. And so I had conversations in the book with a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers and Olympic medalists and startup unicorns. And uh, there was one story in particular from this woman, Dory Clark, who is a New York, she's a uh, Wall Street Journal bestselling author. She's a, a professor of business at Duke. She's just absolutely like one of the top business thinkers in the world. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But she wants to learn how to score Broadway musicals now. This is like a completely different thing that she's doing and it's where her passion lies. And so she went to this, uh, uh, the Lehman Engel uh, Fellowship Program, which is like the top program in the world if you're going to learn how to do this. And okay. she goes in the first day and everybody is going around the room saying like, well, I've scored three Broadway musicals and I've won an Emmy and, or a Tony, like all the things that they've won. And she's sitting there going like, I've scored three whole songs and I don't even know if they're good. But what am I going to do? I can either like put my head into my hoodie and slink out or I could say, you know, Dory, You've had tons of success in other areas of your life where you didn't know anything when you walked in and you learned and you grew and you innovated and you iterated and you figured it out. So it reasons to say that it's not that you're not good at this. You're just not good at this yet. And we can take the confidence that we have in other places and we can borrow that confidence until we have a firmer ground to stand on. So that's the first thing we do when we're like, I've got this gut feeling. I'm not really sure. I've got all these voices of doubt telling me maybe you can't do it. The second ride I want to talk about is the loop-de-loop, -loop, right? Where you keep going back to the beginning over and over and over and over. And that's about adopting a beginner's mindset. Whitney Johnson, who is, again, another one of the top business thinkers in the world, uh, talks about the S curve, where when you're at the bottom of an S, it's, everything is really hard. You don't know what you're doing. You're moving really slowly. And then suddenly you, like, you hit the upswing and things are good. And you're like, I'm figuring this out. Everything's amazing. And then you get to the top again and you're like, things are slowing down. I'm kind of mailing it in a bit. I'm, I'm, I know how to do this. It's not hard anymore. I could just be here forever. But what happens is eventually the S ends and you fall off. Yeah. And when she talked to me about this idea of the S curve, I had this moment where I realized, oh my God, I fell off the top of my S curve. When I was running that search firm that I talked about after 10 years, I had this moment where I went up to a client meeting. And I was not prepared. This is not a story that makes me sound very good, but I did the fancy dancing and the making it up as I went along and the talking out of my ass majorly. And we got the work because I'd been doing it for 10 years and I knew mm. enough to be able to react and respond and I could do it. And on the elevator on the way down, I texted my business partner and I said, I just committed malpractice. I think it's time for me to go. Because I got really lucky, far luckier than I should have that we actually sold that work. That could have, and it should have backfired in a major way. What happens when we get to the top of the S curve is that we start self-sabotaging. And if she had told me while I was running the business that I was going to start self-sabotaging, I would have thought she was insane. Because mm. like, how, why would I self-sabotage? Everything's amazing. We're making right. money. We're changing the world. Things are great. And then when she was telling me the story, I reflected and I said, you know, that's exactly what happened. I self-sabotaged because I got complacent, because I got bored. And so we have to notice when there are these moments when we are no longer bringing our best to the work that we do, when we no longer care as much about the outcome. A friend of mine said to me years later when I was like, you know, I just got sick of pitching. He said, you know, you just got sick of winning. And I thought that was a fascinating way to put it because I was so expecting that we'd get the work because I knew how to do it already that I didn't even, I wasn't working as hard. And those were the moments where I should have said, you know, it's time for me to pack my backpack. And one of the things Whitney taught me is that when we do pack our backpack for the next adventure, the next S curve, we have to make sure to pack everybody else's backpack with us because otherwise they have no idea and they right. get scared. Now, when you pack the, the, this backpack, uh, you also like a leap of faith or you've always known what you were going to do or you just say, no. you know what, I know I'm done with this. 
something will happen in the future, but it's time, it's time now to stop. Is that how, how it happened? Uh, you know, I thought I wanted to go into venture capital. I was like, I've spent the last 15 years building a business. I've built government programs. I've built political action committees. I've built nonprofits. I've built this for-profit business. Like I know how to build things. I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I've spent 20 years sizing up talent, right? Will somebody show up when things go haywire, when everything goes sideways at two in the morning? Will they show up? I've spent 20 years sizing people up. So I was like, that seems like I'd be pretty good at figuring out venture capital, right? Mm. And then I started talking to a lot of venture capitalists and I got offered a lot of great jobs, but I didn't want to work for any of them. <laughs> I was just like, it sounds like a great job, but I don't want to work for any of these guys. These like VC cowboys. There were a few that were nice that, you know, I really enjoyed mm -hmm. that had a good ethos. But for the most part, I'd already had the best job in the world. I didn't want to work for someone else again. I, I, a fellow author, friend of mine, Scott Stratton likes to say that uh, entrepreneur is Latin for bad employee. And after 15 years, I think I was kind of unemployable. I just, I couldn't, right. there was, there was no way it wasn't going to happen. So then I was in this, in this place where I was like, I don't, I don't really know what I want to do next. I don't want to, don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but I had a lot of views about the world. And so that's why I started blogging. And that's why I started doing it. I've never had a very specific idea of what I wanted to do next. And I think that that's what happens with a lot of people. I think we decide to leave something, not because we're running towards something, but because we're running away from something else. Right. I think that's what happens a lot. And so when I sold my company, the first thing I did was say yes to everything around me. I said yes to chairing that art auction. I said yes to a whole bunch of consulting. I said yes to projects that took me six months to unravel myself from because I didn't leave with a clear direction. And my advice to anybody now when they're selling a company or when they're leaving for something new is to just spend some time in the discomfort of not knowing. Mm. We feel like we can't end a bad habit until we've decided a 17 point plan about a good habit. We can't break up with a relationship until we found somebody new. We we can't we can't stop eating crap until we've, you know, figured out the new diet. The truth is we can stop the bad thing without starting anything else and just sit for a little bit and be comfortable being uncomfortable because that's when we discover what we actually care about and what we actually want. Resonate a lot with me, let me tell you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you as well, when, when you were talking about all your successes and uh, what happened, and I'm sure there's been also a moment when the S-curve went, went down very quickly in a very unexpected matter. So I don't know if you, if you can speak about those moments in your life where life hits you and you have to, uh, as Churchill said, when you go through hell, keep walking. Yes, yes. Um, well, you and I are both part of this group, MMT. And I think we were paired in an early conversation. We do those you know, monthly uh, get-togethers and we were paired in an early conversation. I think I told you a little bit about this story on that. So, so we'll get to expand on it now. And in 2021, I was diagnosed with an exceptionally rare autoimmune disease. It's so rare that 800 people in the entirety of the 330 million in the United States were diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty rare. And this is coming off of the end of the pandemic, right? We have just spent the last 10 months trying to survive this pandemic, you know, being safe at home. But remember, I'm a speaker. I make my living as a keynote speaker. I fly to events and I speak on stages. Well, there were no flights. There were no events. There were no stages. All of your meeting planners listening are like, uh-huh, right? They're like starting to twitch. They're getting a little PTSD yeah. from that. So I had just spent the previous 10 months rebuilding my entire business to be a virtual business. I've got two kids in high school. So, you know, dealing with like first love and heartbreak and being separated from their friends. My husband mm -hmm. is an exceptionally stressful job. So I just spent 10 months and we were just kind of coming out of the end of it and things were good. And I was like, I'm going to do the hard 75 and I'm going to work out and I'm going to get everything back together and everything's great. And then my body broke out in a head to toe rash, like a head to toe rash that was like the worst psoriasis plaques you'd ever seen, but not psoriasis. And I gained 20 pounds over the course of three weeks. Whoa. And I couldn't feel my fingers or my toes, everything, my skin was lifting off. I mean, my body was basically eating itself from the outside in. And it took three months to get a diagnosis. And I feel exceptionally lucky that it only took three months. I live in Boston, the center of the medical universe, incredible. 
Mm-hmm. I every once in a while will will post about it and I'll hashtag the disease name and people will be like, oh my God, how did you get better? I've been dealing with this for years. If you would have asked me in early 2021, if I would have seen early 2022, I would not have taken that bet. I did not know what the outcome was going to be. And there is this moment where everything goes south that it's incredibly clarifying about what matters, about who matters, about what you want to be doing with your life, about who you want to be doing it with in your life. And I think I spent hours and hours and hours every night doing three things. The first was uh, Googling symptoms, which by the way, yeah. you, they should just take away the internet connection of anybody who has a rare <laughs> disease. That's, yeah. That did not go well. Number two, and this is very dark, so trigger warning around this one, making mental lists of the videos that I needed to make for my children on high school graduation, when they go to college, college graduation, getting married, first children, all of those things, because I didn't know that I was going to be there to see it. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing was really thinking about who I wanted to be in this next chapter of my life and how I wanted to show up in the world if I had a next chapter. And a lot of that is what came out in Wonder Hell is this idea of we think things are going to be easier when we get to success and they're not. They never are. In fact, they get harder. We get a bigger hunger, a faster pace, things keep Mm -hmm. moving. And we see a potential in us that we never knew existed. Now, I don't talk about the disease at all in Wonder Hell. I mentioned it in, in the acknowledgments to, to thank friends and family and my doctors, actually. But when we have these moments where we realize that there is something else inside of us, whether it is uh, you know, a, a different gear or a different chapter or a different layer, those are the moments that we have to stop and think and figure out what it is we actually want. Because those are the moments where the burden of this potential walks into our psyche and goes, hey, what you got for me? Mm. What are you going to do with this newfound you that you didn't know existed last week, last month, last year? So this book isn't really about this idea of like bigger, better, faster, more. Like you just discovered you could do more, go for it. It's this idea of every time you see that there's a new you inside of you, which you were gonna, you, are you going to choose to be? Are you going to mm-hmm. choose to be the you that was yesterday? Or are you going to choose to be the you that you see as possible in the future? And the only one who gets to decide which you you become is you. Thank you for sharing that. It was just that uh, when you're talking about those videos and everything, it's, um, you know, my wife's grandmother always said, uh, God forbid us uh, from having to experience things that we don't know we'll be able to fight. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, there are, uh, I am not an exceptionally religious person, uh, but there are a lot of, uh, I, I have a lot of friends who are, there are a lot of people in the speaking industry who are who are religious and particularly evangelical. Uh, and a number of them reached out to me during this period. I didn't tell people just how dark it got. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I sort of spoke around the edges. I'd post photos of myself with an IV in my arm, but I didn't. I didn't talk about how dark it got until after when I was able to, as Brene Brown say, right from the scars. So, you know, I tell the story on stage now. And it, I mean, I, the very first time I told the story on stage was the very first standing ovation I ever got. Now I get one every single time when I tell the story because people recognize themselves in the darkest hour. They recognize themselves in this moment where they didn't know. And they see that we can be better than our excuses and we can come through it if we figure it out. And And the the story that I tell is that, you know, in that moment, the first IV goes into my arm and there's a 40% chance of stroke, a 20% chance of death with this drug. But I was like, bring it on because I like the alternative is not good either. And in that moment, I signed up for a marathon because my thinking was I'm either going to be able to run 26.2 miles or I'm going to be six feet under. And there's probably not much in between. And so I sort of tell the story on stage and it's this, it's, it's this moment where I, at the end of the marathon, I, you know, I finish and I, you know, tell them, you know, how much they can do it. And they, they see them. I, I'm very good at helping people see themselves in the story the entire time. But I had a number of evangelical friends reach out to me during this experience saying something along the line of God only gives us what we can handle. You know, God doesn't give us anything that we are, we are not capable of and just know that this is not, end. it is just part of your story. And so, you know, I, I, you're Jewish, I'm Jewish, uh, I'm not an evangelical Christian, but this idea that everything that we go through is teaching us what more we can become mm-hmm. is something that we can assign both to failures and to successes all along the way. Right. Like every person in your life, every relationship, everything that we do, it's all there to help us continue to be in this process of becoming. 
And this idea of wonder hell is that if you've got one foot in yesterday and one foot in tomorrow, you're always in that process of becoming a what I love about the book is that every time I describe it to somebody, they go, you know, I think I might be in wonder hell too. And I'm like, I know, because we all are. Mm. Every one of us is in this process of becoming, of evolving. And so I just, I love people, whether they've just sold their first business or they've sold their first tube of lipstick, right? I love that people can recognize themselves in this journey of becoming. Love it. Absolutely love it. And there's also an, an, another um, thought that uh, I'm, I'm personally um believe in it's that nobody does it alone oh, so when, no. you, when, when you were in in those moments and i'm sure maybe not as dark but you know when in business it's it's a roller coaster to to take your example but it is really a roller coaster to be an entrepreneur um who who did you who were you able uh to count on and uh what is your advice people uh because some people say oh, you know I, i'm alone i'm a, a single uh owner or have only a small team? Mm -hmm. How can I build a a board of advisors? What what is your advice and and who helped you in in those moments? Yeah. uh, So I'll tell you a story about a different moment. Uh, we, we We can pull out of the darkness. This ride is actually in the book in the Doubtsville section as the tunnel of love, right? Like, who are you going to go through the tunnel with? Who's going to be there? You know, we can go farther, faster together. So I'll tell you a story about when my first book, Limitless, came out. Uh, I did not know her very well then. We're dear friends now, but I didn't know her very well then. But Carrie Lorenz is the first female F-14 fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy, Mm. right? Pretty big badass. She stands six feet tall. She wears leather from head to toe when she goes on stage. She won the head of the Charles in college as a rower, and she only left pre-Olympic training to go to flight school, right? Like officer candidate school. So painting you a picture of this incredible woman. She also is a you know, long time, happy marriage, four children. I mean, just like absolutely uh, badass. And I should total shero of mine. So I reached out to her and I was like, Carrie, (laughs) Miss Lorenz, would you maybe consider thinking about possibly one day even pondering blurbing my book? And she wrote back to me immediately and said, yeah, you're a kick-ass woman. I want to support more kick-ass women. Absolutely. Send me the manuscript. So I send her the manuscript. And now the book has not gone to print yet, but I think we're pretty much done. I send her the manuscript and she calls me back about three days later. And I think I'm going to get praise. Dear listener, I did not get praise. And she says, and do you mind if I curse, Eric? No, me? No, go ahead. Okay. So I got to give you the direct quote because this, this story does not work as well without the direct quote. She says to me, and I quote, Laura, you're really fucking smart. And this book is really fucking good, but you're too fucking smart for this book just to be really fucking good. You need to make it really fucking great. And then I'll blurb the shit out of it. Wow. Wow is right. So then she spends 45 minutes on the phone with me. And for the meeting planners listening, she spends the 45 minutes in between sound check and when she goes on stage, which most people know is like the moment where speakers get their head in the game. Yep. Now, she is so good that her head is always in the game. So she could spend this 45 minutes with me uh, before she did what she calls getting show pony ready. So she spends 45 minutes with me. I was like, I know, I know it was like 95% of the way there. And I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't do it. And she's like, well, let me tell you what I think it is. And then she spent 45 minutes on the phone with me, helping me unpack exactly what was wrong. And not only that, introducing me to her editor, who then helped me make the book really fucking great. And then she did blurb the shit out of it. And that book debuted in the Washington Post bestseller list right behind Michelle Obama and got me on the Today Show and Good Morning America and all these amazing things. Because I had somebody sitting in the tunnel of love with me who was not going to let me settle for Mm. mediocrity. She didn't just say, the book is good, fine. She said, the book isn't as good as you can make it. And I think that's really important. And so I think it's, I I think when you're, if you're alone and being an entrepreneur is super, super lonely, I think it's important to have people with you. And I like to make sure that my inner circle at any given time has at least one of three different types of people. Number one, an aspirational. Somebody who I want to be when I grow up, Carrie Lorenz, right? I mentioned Brene Brown earlier, Mel Robbins. Like, who are the people who are in this business who are fantastic? Who, when I get off stage, people say, you know, you remind me of this person. What? I remind you of Mel? Incredible. How do I now figure out a way to get Mel to blurb Wonder Hell, which, P.S., she did. Incredible. Mm. But how do I get her to do that? How do I get to know her? Because I want to learn from her. She's further along on the path than I am. And I want to make sure I'm learning from the best about how to get there. Number one. Number two, a peer. 
So somebody who is in the struggle with you, somebody who is at your level, who is learning along the way so that when you learn something about uh, you know, about uh, the SEO and they learn something about newsletter growth, you can teach each other, right? So you're both doing it. So it's, you're not just one person in the fight. You're kind of one and a half people in the fight mm-hmm. because you can use some of their brain share. It's also somebody to complain to. It's somebody to, to, to commiserate with, right? It's somebody to sort of just be in the process so that you don't feel so alone all the time. And then the third type of person is a mentee. So many of us have imposter syndrome all the time. And in this book, interviewing these hundred incredible, like just superhuman people, I was shocked to find out how many of them still have imposter syndrome every time they try to do a thing they haven't done before, which of course is why they're imposters because they haven't been there before. Having a mentee, somebody who you can, uh, who calls upon you to ask you questions, the best way that you can feel like you know something is to teach somebody something that just comes natural to you at this point. So if somebody's going to call me up and they're going to be like, Laura, how do you organize your content so that you're always hitting your audience exactly with what they need to hear? I can go, oh, easy. Let me tell you how I put this together. And they're like, oh, that's brilliant. It's not brilliant. It just took me a lot of trial and error to get there. But once they tell me, oh, it's so great the way you tell the story or how you, you know, you, you, you approach this client or how you got this connection, you know, and, and, and relationship with the bureau. I can just teach them how to do it. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I do know what I'm doing a little bit. Cool. Mm -hmm. So while I'm staring at the aspirational and feeling like I'm never going to be as good as them, I can also be like, well, I can also see where I've come from as well. And then that helps build the confidence moving forward. Love it. So aspirational peer and mentee. Yes. Talking about imposter syndrome. I've been, I have three daughters. According to my wife, I'm the father of three daughters. So (laughs) I've been brainwashing them. Since the beginning, we had, uh, since I read Lean In from Sheryl yes. Sandberg, we had her picture and the quote, if anybody tell you that you're bossy, tell them you have executive leadership skills. So that's yes. always since they were kids. Now, the other one is, is uh, going to graduate, is going into the, uh, the, the working uh, world. And she said, well, I don't know if I should apply for this. And I, I reminded her of a story that I read in Lean In, which is basically when there is an opening, a job opening. Men who qualify maybe 50% will run for it. And women will wait to have to be confident that at least 85%, 90% of their skills qualify to apply. So they've been passing on all the time. Is it also your experience? And and what would you say to all the the, the women listening, and especially to all my daughters listening, when they're going to get into the, the working world, the real world? Well, I would say that the statistics of women needing to have 85% of qualifications is probably actually lower. It's it's actually probably worse than that. Hmm. Based on 20 years of executive search, what I can tell you are the men that applied were like, I'm breathing. Awesome. I'm qualified. And the women were like, I don't have every single thing. It says, you know, you need a graduate degree and you have to have, uh, uh, you know, you have to have a a depth of understanding in this, this particular area. And I have to be able to raise, you know, $10 million a year and you need to have 15 years of experience. And I've got all those things. I said, I only have 14 years of experience. Maybe I shouldn't apply. And you're just like, oh my God. And what the other thing I can tell you from 20 years of executive search experience is that there are no perfect candidates. Literally not a single candidate ever hits every single qualification 100%. And mm-hmm. it's a matter of what else they bring to the table that might not be on that list also. So I would say apply, apply with abandon. And if you're applying, even if you don't get the job, you get experience in the interview process. And even if you get the interview process, you get experience in the job application process. And keeping your resume up to date and your cover letter and just like being in that space where you are putting yourself in the deal flow actually makes you luckier. There's a, another chapter in Wonder Hell called The Fortune Teller, and it's all about how you make your own luck. And one of the things that we've learned is that you can actually make yourself luckier. There are people aren't just born lucky or unlucky. You can make yourself luckier by putting yourself in the deal flow, by applying for things, by having conversations, for letting people know that you're out there and available for for, for positions so that when something comes up, because most of the jobs are actually not listed, when something comes up, they're like, oh, let me think about Eric's daughter. She'd be great for this. And then they reach out to you and then you're an applicant pool of one, right? Mm-hmm. So- that's a pretty good way to do it. So she can make her yeah. own luck, but the only way you can do that is to like be constantly in the flow. So that's the first piece. The second piece is imposter syndrome itself is gaslighting women all over the place. Like just 
think about the name imposter syndrome. You're an imposter. You don't belong. Maybe you should leave. You have a syndrome. Gee, are you sick? Maybe you should sit down, right? So like what imposter syndrome does is it says that there's something wrong with us. There's, you know, a, a, a couple of uh, women who wrote an article in Harvard Business Review uh, who talked about how imposter syndrome is actually being placed on the imposters as if we're, we are, you know, awful, that we are victims, that it's our mm -hmm. fault. When in fact, the systems were built by, you know, cisgendered, straight white males. Yeah. So of course we're imposters because the system wasn't built by us or for us. So of course we feel like we don't belong. The system is created, This you know, the nine to five workforce was created for when men went to go work and women stayed home. Like mm -hmm. who's to say that the only time that work can get done is nine to five. That executive search firm that I ran for 15 years, we were purely virtual. I founded it in 2002. Wow. We were remote before it was COVID cool, right? Like we never had office space. I had staff mm -hmm. who worked everywhere from, you know, S Seattle around the world to Siberia, right? I literally had staff all over the world and they worked whenever they needed to work. If we had a client meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon, they were on that Zoom for, well, it wasn't Zoom at the time, but they were on that meeting for, you know, the 2 p.m. But if they were working at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m., I didn't care. And people were always like, how do you judge the quality of your team's work? And I was like, okay, you sitting down? by the quality of my team's work. Like yeah. it's not rocket science. And so if we are feeling like imposters, it's not because there's something wrong with us. It's just because we're working within a system that wasn't built for us. And so it's, it's important for us to understand that if we start by assigning ourselves as the interloper, then we're already assigning ourselves from back behind the starting line. But if we assign mm -hmm. ourselves from isn't this great? I'm bringing a diversity of ideas, of background, and good for me. I feel like an imposter because I'm in a place I never thought I'd get to. How cool is that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, oh my God, I've never done this before. It's, oh my God, I've never done this before. And so it's really just about renegotiating the emotions that we have around the doors that we're walking through. I love it. I love it. And one thing that also struck my mind listening to you is that uh, uh, you're obviously uh, a very um, determined, strong, and experienced person, and you also have an open mind to be able to get criticism. When when the, you, the story you, you mentioned about Carrie Lawrence telling you when when your book is ready, and then that <laughs> she's telling you it's it, it's not good, um, and you instead of reacting against that, you take it in, you go back, and you make it even better, which is wonderful. And that's also something that getting criticism and being open to that uh, takes a lot of courage, but also takes a lot of good mentor. Carrie is a good mentor to you. So how do you find mentors uh, in this world, in this competitive world? So I don't look for mentors. I look for mentoring moments. And I think there's a really big difference between those. When you look for a mentor, if somebody called me up right now and they're like, Laura, I'd love for you to be my mentor. Be like, I don't have time for that, right? I'm launching a book. I'm on the road every single week. My youngest is graduating from high school and I want to be present. Like I want the time I have free to be present for him, right? I want to like, I, I may love you, but you are not my priority right now to mentor right. you. But if somebody called me up and said, Laura, I'm having this problem. Can we spend 15 minutes? Can we spend an hour? Can we talk about this one particular problem? Because you are the person of all the people in the world, like you are the one who I know has the, the perspective to help me through this. Now, they may just be like, I have, I need some help. Can I pick your brain about some random thing? And I'll be like, you know what? I'm probably not the right person. There's a lot of other people. But if I am the person who can help somebody through it, I'll absolutely spend those 15 minutes, that half hour, that hour, whatever it is they need. Mm -hmm. I'll often tell them they should call me at six in the morning because that's when I'm on my treadmill or my rowing machine and we can meet and move instead of meeting and eating because that doesn't work for me. It also takes away the middle of my day. It, and I end up losing, you know, the stuff that I do for myself. My self-care hour is the thing that always falls apart when somebody wants to pick my brain. It also, um, it gets rid of some of the tire kickers, right? So if somebody really, really wants my help, they'll figure out a way to, to, to be there for when I need them. And they're like, wait, but I, I don't know that I could talk for an hour and work out. I'm like, you don't have to. Like, I'm going to be working out. We're going to be on the phone. You could be sitting at your desk. I don't care. But if you want my free advice, I'm going to give, I need to be not losing that hour. So I'm happy to give somebody a mentoring moment anytime they need it. I look for mentoring moments from my mentors. Like I can't say to Carrie, 
hey, I want you to be my mentor. Can we spend an hour a week or an hour a month every month? She doesn't have time for that. But if I call her up and I say, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this one particular speaking gig that I've been offered, it's international, they want to do books, I'm not quite sure, how do I figure mm-hmm. out the, the fee? She'll give me a mentoring moment around that thing. And then if I go back to her or any, somebody's giving me a mentoring moment a couple of days later and I tell her how it was resolved and then I reach out to her later and I tell her how the event went and all of a sudden she's invested in my success, those mentoring moments actually do turn into mentor relationships, but they're not built on this artificial calendar. They're built on actual content and need. Love it. That's great thought. Thank you for that. And you can have a million mentoring moments, even yeah. if you're not just like one mentor, right? Like if you have one mentor who can mentor you about entrepreneurship, well, what happens when you run into a problem about, you know, in your marriage because you're busy as an entrepreneur? Does that entrepreneur still have the same outlook that you do? Who knows? Yeah. So yeah. finding people who can give you mentoring moments about what's actually needed right now, I think is a better way to go. Oh, wonderful. Um, talking about the Wonder Hell again, um, and the, those three different parks that you have, um, and listening to you, first, I, I can't wait to read the whole book because uh, you seem to me to have written a book which is not only telling stories, but stories with uh, an ID that I can apply in my life, which, which yes. is wonderful. Uh, and, and thank you for, for that. When you're writing uh, Wonder Hell, when do you know that, okay, this is a story I'm going to tell and, and what are people can expect when they're reading the book now? Yeah. Uh, so I did not set out to write Wonder Hell. Um, again, this is another serendipitous thing. After Limitless came out, and as I mentioned, it debuted Washington Post bestseller. I was on Today Show, all these great things. I was on an airplane on the way back from speaking at an event. And it was a series of three events in Canada. Each had 2,500 people. There were four speakers on stage. And then the fifth was like the big keynote of the day. And that fifth speaker was Malala. Like Malala, Malala. So like (laughs) my book launches, I'm opening for Malala. And by the way, when I saw her in the green room and I walked up to her and I was like, I'm going to tell her how she's inspired me, how she inspired my children, how I'm so proud to know that she's in the world. And I yeah. walked up to her and all I could manage to say was, I like your shoes. No. <laughs> she was wearing this amazing pair of red suede stiletto shoes. And I was like, are those Giovanni Rosso? I like your shoes. And she looked at me and she's like, yes. <laughs> that was my Malala moment. So yeah, you want to talk about still having imposter syndrome? I'm in the green room with Malala and I compliment her shoes. So Uh, I did take a selfie and I get on the airplane to fly home because the next morning is my goddaughter's bat mitzvah, right? So Friday afternoon, open for Malala. Saturday morning, goddaughter's bat mitzvah. Not going to miss either one of those two things, but then I had to be on a red eye. And I'm on this red eye and my client had booked me an amazing like lie flat, first class, fantastic. And then there was a change in aircraft and I ended up in a center seat and coach behind these like two former linebackers. And I'm 52. So I'm like, I do all for that shit. It was really hard. I could not sleep. I'm like having like a hot flash on the plane. And so I open up my laptop and I just start writing the screed of a post on Facebook. And it goes something like it's 4.30 in the morning, or maybe it's 7.30 in the morning, or maybe it's 1.30 in the morning. I was flying back from Vancouver and I was like, I've got 1,200 miles behind me and 1,200 more to go. And somewhere between the blur that was yesterday and the blur that will be tomorrow is the space I'm in right now. And the space that I'm in right now is wonder hell. It's incredible. It's amazing. It's wonderful that I was able to have this experience yesterday. And also now all I can think of is, well, I was on the Today Show. How do I get on Good Morning America? If I could get on Good Morning America, who gets to sit under the oak tree with Oprah? She's got to pick someone. Why not me? And Mm -hmm. all I ever get from this like self-help nonsense is if you can name it, you can tame it. And I was like, I don't want to do that. If you can name it, you can claim it. I want to say right now that I'm going to be unapologetic about what I want to be and who I think I can be and how big Limitless can be. And why not? It's exciting. It's wonderful. It's humbling, but it's also now anxiety provoking and stress inducing and identity shifting. And it's kind of hell. It's wonder hell. And within like five minutes of posting that on Facebook, like I got like a hundred comments and shares and people were like, that's a great word. And a friend was like, not for nothing, but wonderhell.com is available and you should buy it for 99 cents. And my publisher of Limitless said, I just got to say that Wonderhell would make a great 
title for your next book. And I was like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Didn't think anything of it. Keep doing my speaking things for like eight or nine more months. And then boom, COVID happened. And then I found myself doing this like online, showing up for my community every single day at 10 a.m. and just talking at the camera about like, we can get through this and we can do it. And I believe in us. And after like two weeks, I got really bored of my own voice. So I was like, I should bring people on. I've got a bunch of interesting friends who are all in the speaking and writing world and they can talk about their stuff and we can all make content together. And we started having these conversations and the conversations I didn't realize all kind of looped around this moment, this moment where people, their entire career shifted into doing something different because I'm endlessly fascinated by people's stories being a headhunter for 20 years. And after doing that for about six months, having like a hundred different conversations, I was like, you know, there's kind of a theme here. Mm. Hmm. And then I got a Facebook memory served up to me of this blog post. And I was like, oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Thank you, past me, for having an idea. Thank you, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, for creating Facebook yeah. memory <laughs> so that it can be served back to me. And then I was like, there it is. It's a theme. And then I was having a conversation with Rahaf Harfouche, who is my peer in my inner circle world. She's my work, my work wife. We talk every morning at, or every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. And she's like, you know, she's like all of these conversations. She's like, it's kind of like success is an amusement park. We think it's going to be fun, but it's not. All these people you've talked to, it's not fun. She's like, you should make, she's like, you should like just make a giant map of all the different emotions and have a like, you are here stamp. And then over the course of the next 45 minutes, we basically developed this into Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City. And there were like six other towns that, you know, we eventually edited down with my editor and as I was writing it. But that's how the book came about. That that was the writing process of how to do it was really doing this body of research. And then after that, realizing, oh, there are universal themes from all of these incredible people that seem bold-faced names doing these crazy things. But there are universal lessons for every single one of us in Mm -hmm. their stories. Love it. That's a beautiful story. Laura, I can listen to you for hours, which uh, I'm looking forward to doing at the the next MMT conference. Um, I was going to say, the book, I I narrate the audio book, so you can. (laughs) You can, in fact, listen (laughs) to me for hours if you you really want to. (laughs) before I ask you the the champagne question, and I'll explain it uh, in, in a moment. Um, so, Wonder Hell available today. Um, where? Uh, Wonder Hell is available at wonderhell.com, but also Amazon, Books and Noble, Indigo, anywhere, your bookshop.org for local bookstores, anywhere fine books are sold. And if people want to reach out to you, uh, book you for speaking engagement, it's wonderhell.com. Uh, they can go to lauragastneraudding.com or all my friends call me LGO. So I am at hey, H-E-Y-L-G-O on all the social platforms. Wonderful. So my uh, last question, uh, you, you uh, rightly re- um, referred to MMT, where we met uh, the amazing Jason Gagnard created yes. this fantastic community. And he has always this question, which I love. Um, the champagne question, uh, when we meet again in one year with a bottle of champagne, what will we be celebrating? Ooh, I mean, right now, I would say that we're celebrating Wonder Hell making all the big lists and my uh, inbox filled with people who want to have me come and help them through these moments so that they can learn that on the other side of this Wonder Hell is just the next one and the next one and the ne- next one, but it's possible to enjoy the ride. But if I'm being completely honest, I don't care about any of that. We are celebrating that my family is healthy, that my my older son, who's a sophomore in college, is still happy, that the nice Jewish girl he met on the very first day or the very first uh, week of orientation is still madly in love with him, that my younger son about to go to college finds his people there, that my, my marriage is intact, my health is good. I just... That's more important to me than anything else. So I think my champagne moment is that I am in a place where I'm able to get together in a year and celebrate and just really continue to enjoy the ride. Amen to that. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Laura, for taking the time. And wow, what an amazing book you've written. Uh, I can't wait 
to read it and especially the stories you shared. That's really wonderful. It's wonder hell, uh, everyone available uh, as from today. If you want to connect with me, please follow me on LinkedIn or join my Facebook group, www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.